Um, I appreciate everybody for tuning in. I'm excited to, to speak with you today. Um, as Sunshine mentioned, I am a NOAA federal employee, so I just have to do the basic boilerplate. Thoughts and opinions are my own. I don't represent NOAA necessarily, but I am happy to talk with you today and um, talk a little bit about my science. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Let's see. All right. Can we see slides? Cool. Um, yeah, so I'm here to talk to you a little bit about why marine heat waves happen. Um, and that will encompass, you know, a broader set of questions that include, you know, what a marine heat wave is um, and, and the physical drivers that lead to different marine heat waves and where we expect to see these sorts of things, um, both, you know, today in modern climate and in future climate. Um, so when we're trying to ask the question, you know, why do marine heat waves happen? Um, really, the question that we're trying to answer is, um, you know, what, what are they to begin with, right? If you if you just walked down on the street, you wouldn't necessarily know what a marine heat wave is. And, um, you know, before I keep going here, Sunshine, I have this little um, toolbar at the top. Do you all see that as well? Or do you, is it, I just want to make sure it's not blocking the slide for y'all, because it is for me. I think it's, did it go away now? No, I, it's on my end. I think it's just a Zoom feature. Normally it scrolls up, but it's okay. As long as you can see the slide, that's fine. Um, so yeah, let's zoom out here a little bit. You know, what, what is a marine heat wave? Um, I'll just give you an example of what one of these were. Um, this was a, a marine heat wave that occurred in the North Pacific, the North East, Northeast Pacific from 2013 to 2015. Uh, many of you may be familiar with it already. This is what we call the North Pacific warm blob um, in you know, both in the scientific literature and in the public interest, um, we refer to it as the warm blob um, because it was this big mass of warming that was found off um, the west coast of the United States, sort of in the Gulf of Alaska region. Um, and so that, that in, in essence, is what a marine heat wave is. It's an extreme ocean warming um, in a part of the world, and it can vary in size, it can vary in intensity, um, and it can vary in uh, how long it persists, whether that's, you know, several weeks or several months, or in this case, this one lasted for you know, almost a year and a half. Um, and we're pretty specific about what we mean by extreme ocean warming. Um, specifically, we refer to a, a marine heat wave as an event that is what we call in the 90th percentile. So basically a one in 10 year event. So something that is, you know, not something that happens all the time. The ocean does change temperature a lot, but um, these temperature changes are really, really intense and really, really extreme. And so this, these maps and what I'm showing you here are sea surface temperature anomalies. So deviations from what's normal. and um, red colors are warmer, much warmer than normal, and on, on order of, you know, something like two degrees Celsius, so about four degrees Fahrenheit warmer than normal. Um, and we care about these things because they have devastating impacts on marine ecosystems, particularly in the California current system off the west coast of the United States, because there's a lot of um, really sensitive marine ecosystems that can't adjust to rapid changes in temperature or temperature changes that last for a very long time. They simply can't get out of the way or they can't, um, you know, they can't adjust their, their feeding schedule to, to deal with these temperature changes. And just to give you an example of this, um, I, I was a graduate student in San Diego during this particular event. So I, I was right next to the ocean when it happened. And, um, you know, zooming in on this little bullseye here, we would go to the beaches at this time in sort of 2014, 2015. And we would, we would often see massive die-offs of different critters that live along the California current system. And so these are red tuna crabs um, that you know, really strongly responded to this warming signal along the U.S. West Coast. Um, so marine heat waves can have, you know, devastating impacts on marine ecosystems. So we really need to understand what drives them, how better to predict them, um, and how they might change in the future. So at their core, a marine heat wave is just a change in ocean temperature. So really, when we're thinking about what physically drives a marine heat wave, we're really just asking the question, what drives changes in ocean temperature. And then we can sort of ramp those up, turn those knobs more, and we can get a sense for what drives extreme changes in ocean temperature. But to answer this question, um, you know, it's kind of complicated, right? It sort of depends on where you are in the ocean. The ocean is this big thing that is really, really deep. On average, the ocean is about four and a half kilometers deep. Um, and the physical drivers that change ocean temperature are going to be different depending on where you are within the water column. Um, so for the purposes of a marine heat wave, marine heat waves really only happen at least in the way that I'm going to be speaking about them today, really happen in this thin, you know, really thin layer of the ocean, uh, sort of in the upper 200 to 250 meters um, of the ocean. And, we're, and the physical drivers that I'm going to talk to you about today are, are going to be relatively confined to that really thin layer. Um, so let's, let's zoom in on one of these layers. We'll zoom in on a, on a strip of ocean that's about 200 meters deep and let's say tens of kilometers long or, or wide in the horizontal, maybe even 100 kilometers wide in the horizontal. So 
um, when you think about this slice of ocean, it's really like a big pancake, right? It's like a really thin, really, really um, horizontally um, dispersed piece of ocean, but relatively thin with respect to the whole breadth of the ocean. Um, so let's zoom in on that volume. Okay, so we have our volume of ocean, and now we can think about you know, what changes the temperature for this volume of the ocean? How do we build a marine heat wave, for example? Um, and, you know, to, to get an understanding of what changes ocean temperature, you really have to understand, you know, what's normal. Like, why does the ocean have a temperature to begin with? What changes, what, what drives ocean temperature um, in one location of the world, say the tropics, um, versus uh, the high latitudes in the polar region, right? Why, is the, why are the poles really cold and why are the tropics really warm? So, you know, what, what is normal? Um, so we can think about the processes that lead to a normal temperature, and then we can start to think about how we change those processes to get a change in the ocean temperature itself. Um, so one thing that can change the temperature of this volume or, or, or drive what's a normal ocean temperature in this volume is probably the most obvious thing that we could all think about, and that's solar radiation, so sunlight. Um, sunlight can come down from space, it enters the Earth's atmosphere, and you know some of it's reflected back out to space by shiny things, things like clouds and ice and other things, but um, some fraction of it does reach the ocean surface and that drives warming, that, that causes the ocean to warm. Um, another kind of uh, radiation that can cause the ocean to warm and cool um, is what we call long wave radiation or, or infrared radiation. It's this uh, other form of radiation that um, objects that are at Earth-like temperatures, so um, temperatures that you and I experience every day, um, they're constantly emitting infrared radiation, long wave radiation, and that's because we have um, the kind of temperature that we do. So there are, there are gases in the atmosphere, um, things like CO2, for example, other greenhouse gases. Um, they're all constantly emitting infrared radiation all the time, this long wave radiation in all directions. And that includes back down at the ocean. And the ocean is emitting that long wave radiation back out to space all the time. And so there's this balance between what's coming in from the atmosphere versus what's coming out from the ocean. And, and that can change the temperature of the ocean as well. Um, another thing that can control the temperature in this volume is what we call sensible heat. And, you know, I'm using these jargony phrases um, just because you may, you know, may, you may interview a scientist down the road that uses the jargony phrases. And I just want to build that familiarity with you about what some of these phrases mean. Um, but basically, sen sensible heat is um, uh, what we call a heat flux. Um, uh, it's an energy transfer between the ocean and the overlying atmosphere. Um, and it's primarily driven by the temperature difference between them. So generally speaking, the ocean is warmer than the overlying atmosphere. And so the ocean wants to the flux heat. It wants, to, it wants to bring the atmosphere into equilibrium with it. And it, want to, it wants to make it the same temperature. So it loses energy to the atmosphere to do that. Um, so that's what we think of as a sensible heat. It's that temp temperature difference between the ocean at the surface and the overlying atmosphere. Um, another... Uh, Another energy flux or another heat flux that um, we can think about that, that influences this ocean temperature is related to um, the wind field. So over the ocean, the winds are blowing and the, you know, the ocean is this infinite reservoir of, of water that can, um, you know, is, is ready to be evaporated. So if the wind is blowing over the ocean, it starts to evaporate water at the surface. And this drives what we call a latent heat flux, um, which intuitively, again, this is a jargony phrase, but intuitively we all know what this is. Um, it's, it's basically that, that sensation you feel when you step out of the shower or if you're sweating and the wind blows on you and you feel the water on your skin evaporate, um, you feel that cool, that cooling sensation, that's latent heat. That's basically what happens over the ocean too. The wind blows, it evaporates water at the surface. It takes energy to do that evaporation, that phase change from a liquid to a gas. And that, that, that energy transfer is felt as a temperature decrease. And so that causes the ocean to, to, to change its temperature as well. Um, other things that can control the volume, the, the, the temperature within this volume are uh, obviously ocean currents can move water around, right? It can bring wa warm water in, it can bring cold water in, it can move warm or cold water out. Um, so this is another sort of process, what we call advection, ocean current advection. Um, and a lot of these processes, as I mentioned, they happen in a very thin, in even thinner layer of the ocean. So we're really only looking at the top 200 meters right now, but a lot of these processes are associated with atmospheric um, interactions. So inter inter uh, um, interacting with uh, drivers from the atmosphere. And so what ends up happening is that a lot of the times we get um, this barrier where we get a, a really thin, warm upper ocean layer um, that is separated physically by um, a density gradient that um, separates it from the cold, deep abyss. So um, for, most, uh, for most purposes, you can think about a marine heat, labor, la uh, marine heat wave or any you know, major change in ocean temperature, 
not even happening in that top 200 meter, meters, but really in this really even thinner warm upper ocean layer. Um, and we call this thing the mixed layer, where the temperature is relatively uniform in this warm upper ocean layer. And then there's a rapid change in temperature down to this relatively uniform temperature, cold, deep ocean layer. And there, there can be mixing across this layer um, that also influences the temperature you know, in this relatively warm upper ocean layer. Um, and what's interesting and, and, and cool, in my opinion, is that this mixed layer can change its depth. So it can go down, it can go up. Um, but what, what's really important about this is that the mixed layer, the, 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 uh, the amount of water, the volume of water that's in this warm upper ocean layer um, controls how much energy it takes to, to change the temperature in that volume. So it's the same idea as if you put a bunch of water in a pot to boil, the more water you add, the longer it'll take to boil. If you have less water, it'll boil much quicker. So that's the same idea for the mixed layer. If the mixed layer is really, really deep, it takes way more energy to warm up that volume of water because there's simply more of it. But if the mixed layer is really thin, then it takes much less energy to get that, that, that volume of water to, to change temperature rapidly. Um, so these are all the processes, right? These are the processes that, that lead um, to, to what causes a temperature to be, to be anything in the ocean. So this is the distribution of normal, quote unquote, normal ocean temperatures throughout the world where reds are warmer and blues are colder. And there, this distribution, this pattern is completely shaped by those processes I showed you in the previous slide. Um, and some, in some parts of the world, solar radiation is more important, like in the tropics, so it, it warms much more. In some parts of the world, ocean currents move cold water around, like on the western part of the United States, where you get um, much colder uh, temperatures than you might expect, given its latitude from solar radiation. So um, it's all just a balance between these different processes. So if you want to change the ocean temperature, you have to change any of these. These are all knobs. These are all knobs that can be turned. So if you change any of these processes, you're going to change the ocean's temperature. And a marine heat wave, which is an extreme change in ocean uh, temperature, um, is really just some combination of turning these knobs in such a way that you get this massive warming all at once. So I'll just give you an example of how, the, of how this works. And I'll specifically speak to this 2019. Um, there was a, a marine heat wave in uh, the North Pacific during 2019. It looked like this. Um, if you're interested in you know, the, the nitty gritty details, I'll just refer you to this paper that I, I um, was a lead author of um, that summarized this event specifically. Um, but basically, um, this event was fairly simple, really. The dynamical drivers that led to this event were fairly simple. A lot of the terms that you see here in this sort of jumbled arrowy mess um, weren't all that important. There were a few terms that were really important. So let's just clean this up a little bit. Um, for this particular event, um, these were the only terms that mattered. These were the only knobs that got turned. Um, for example, the mixed layer was really, really shallow at this time. And so there was less water, um, less, there was a smaller volume of water to be warmed, basically. So it took less energy to get a really massive temperature response. Um, also during this time, there were much fewer low clouds. There were much fewer clouds that were that are found about 200 feet, 200 meters off the, ground, off the ocean surface. Um, and because of that, there was more solar radiation, more solar heating of the upper ocean because there was fewer clouds to reflect that sunlight away. Um, also during this time, the winds were much weaker. So this was another knob that was being turned. Um, if you weaken the winds, you end up getting less evaporational cooling, right? You, 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 you cool your skin less by evaporating that water off. So, you know, the combination of more solar heating, so more heating from the sun and less cooling from wind ended up creating this extreme upper ocean warming. And, because, and, and not to mention that those two different sources of energy changes had to, had to warm a much thinner volume because the mixed layer was much shallower as well. Um, so it was this combination of turning knobs that led to an extreme upper ocean warming. And this thing persisted for, in, in many ways, it's still going on, but um, this thing persisted for months, uh, I would say six to six to nine months before it sort of really started to dissipate in any appreciable manner. Um, so that's it. I mean, that's that's how you get a marine heat wave, right? You have these different processes that control what, what we call normal upper ocean temperatures, that radiation, um, evaporation, currents, winds, all of these different knobs. And if you want to change ocean temperature, um, you just change any of these processes, right? You just turn these knobs and you get some change in ocean temperature. If you want a marine heat wave, which is an extreme, you know, 90th percentile change in ocean temperature, then you just really crank those knobs, right? You get intense changing uh, in one of these terms. You get compounding changes where, you know, you change solar radiation and you also decrease the winds and those are compounding factors. Or, you know, you could change more, one or more of these factors for a long period of time. And over a long period of time, the ocean will get warmer and warmer and warmer because these, um, 
these different knobs that you've turned have been persistently changed. Uh, and this can really lead to lead you to a marine heat wave. Um, and so a natural question that some of you might have is, you know, what turns these knobs in reality? Why did why do these things happen? Why do why do we um, get extreme uh, uh, changes in low clouds or extreme changes in winds that lead to extreme sea surface temperature changes as well? Um, so what turns the knobs? You know, a lot of times it's just random, right? It's random weather events or random forms of climate variability that um, are not super predictable um, with respect to when they occur, but they are fairly predictable once that once we know they exist. Um, so that's one form of initiation for a marine heat wave. Uh, another form is what we call remote forcing. So this idea that there are uh, climate forms of climate forcing, climate variability in the tropics, things like the El Nino Southern Oscillation, that um, reorganizes weather patterns in a predictable way all over the globe. Um, and this can also initiate uh, a marine heat wave in different parts of the planet. Um, one, one thing that does not turn the knobs that I sort of want to emphasize here is global warming. Um, global warming does not cause marine heat waves. Um, that being said, global warming could potentially be stacking the dice in such a way or um, stacking the cards in, in such a way that uh, marine heat waves are um, uh, more likely in the future. Uh, it's really just making the conditions such that it's easier to get a, a, a large temperature response in the future. But global warming itself does not cause any individual marine heat wave. And the same, this is the same argument that can be made for hurricanes, right? Global, warmings don't, global warming doesn't uh, cause any individual hurricane, but it, the conditions that the hurricane exists in can be influenced by global warming and cause it to be more intense as a result. Um, so with that, um, I'm happy to take any questions, field any discussion. Um, here's my email. Please feel free to email me with any questions that you might have, any follow-up that you'd like. Um, I have a Twitter account. Feel free to tweet at me or whatever. Um, and then I'm also going to be participating in the additional chat next week um, at 3.30, 4.30 Eastern. Um, in case we don't get a chance to catch up here.